So I hear you asking me, who is an investment banker? I want to become an investment banker. How do I do it? These are questions that I have theoretically gotten from, from people in my very busy inbox. So today, the video will be around explaining to you what an investment banker is, who they are, when you can be an investment banker, why you would want to be an investment banker, and how you can become an investment banker. Now, we can answer them in any way possible, but most of them gravitate around the central idea of money. So it is very important that you understand the impetus for choosing to be an investment banker is almost exclusively around money. Uh, and therefore, some corollary to that is status. But in general, we can think of a Patrick Bateman in um, American Psycho, who is a uh, investment banker. He's a vice president, uh, which is just a title. Uh, and he is therefore this, uh, what was supposed to be a caricature of a American materialist psychopathic, uh, what you might say is a uh, the leitmotif of the 90s in terms of drug using and women abusing uh, psycho. Yeah, in, in any case, what we can do is demystify maybe some of these topics in a way that is ideally helpful. Uh, and if not helpful, then at least entertaining. So uh, what is an investment banker uh, is probably the best part. An investment banker is someone who works for, as you may have surmised, an investment bank. So it is that you have a bank which necessarily helps customers and clients do things that aren't just depositing money and borrowing per se for business operational things. An investment bank is one with typically a license to operate in what we like to call corporate finance, as well as sales and trading, equity research, and in the markets in general, markets being the stock market. So for our own contextual application here, when someone mentions something like Morgan Stanley or JP Morgan or Goldman Sachs, they are talking about investment banks. When someone's talking about a rural lending bank where you get a car loan, probably not an investment bank. There are two types of banks. They both can do both of the functions and some uh, typically do like a bank called Santander or RBC or the Royal Bank of Scotland, HSBC. These are all both retail, but also commercial and investment banks. So they have different arms and they're always these large conglomerates. In any case, we're, we're interested in the investment banking part here, uh, which is a not very old institution, probably started something like in the 1950s. Uh, you would have archetypal investment bankers like JP uh, Morgan, uh, Pierpoint, and uh, men like that in the late 1800s who were heavily involved with financing activities for particularly railroad companies. And then before that, you have men like the Medici's uh, or the Rothschilds who were heavily involved with war financings and other types of financings. But the corporate finance, particularly in investment banking now as we know it, was generally born out of the 60s and 70s whereby we had a humongous uh, and prodigious increase in financial activity and particularly related to the buying and selling of companies as well as the other types of financing that became available. Uh, in that we can then diagnose more or less functions that are required to do these processes better. So in any uh, Faustian sense, you, you would normally have this, okay, we've now got a new process. How do we make it better, faster, uh, more efficient? That's the, the typical Faustian mindset and it also applies to investment banking. So an investment banker sells companies and you can think of them as, well, not all investment bankers, there are some roles like equity research, uh, where sometimes they'll call themselves investment bankers or sales and traders, where they'll call themselves investment bankers. Those functions are, are, are similar but different. So em equity research is around publishing reports on public companies, recommending buy and selling. They're functionally useless uh, except for relationship building. Sales and tradies are um, the real money hungry men uh, and women of the universe, whereby you'll hear almost not, nothing about them because they'll be selling uh, either plain or exotic securities, things like uh, you can have commodity traders selling things like oil and metals, but you can also have bond salesmen and um, swaps. Anything you might think of as being, wow, this is really fancy finance stuff is usually sold by sales and traders to large um, other 
tr- or, well, companies who, who try to make money off of these things or hedge risk, things like that. But the ones we're talking about today are the, uh, the real estate agents or the car salesmen of the financial world, the men who sell um, women who buy and se- help buy and sell companies, I should say, don't actually perform the, the anything other than the dressing up of the pig and putting the lipstick on the pig and or helping the pig get slaughtered by a particular company, usually a strategic buyer, could be a large corporate company like Disney or a private equity firm like Apollo. Uh, so you will always employ investment bankers, typically on both sides of a transaction. This is denoted by the term sell side and buy side. So if you're a sell side banker, you are helping to sell the company. If you're a buy side banker, you will be helping buy a company. There's different advice that you will help give and this is why you're paid inordinate amounts of money, uh, typically because you have good relationships with people who have information on the asset you are trying to buy and you will be leveraging that insider, well insider, uh, bespoke information we might call it, uh, whereby you will hopefully leverage your knowledge to get a better price if you're selling it or a cheaper price if you're buying it and or uh, some sort of uh, combination therein. So hopefully that gives a, a fairly good pricey of what investment banking is in a well, like a, a conceptual sense. Uh, and then we can delve a little bit more into uh, who are investment bankers. Typically, investment bankers live in London or New York. Uh, if you don't live in those two cities, you are in a tier two market probably uh, and thereby less status and or elite and or whatever moniker you would choose to use in terms of describing yourself there's a very snobbish atmosphere and airs to investment banking because uh, you need to be able to distinguish whether you're an elite banker versus a non-elite banker Uh, uh, so it's all very funny uh, because obviously to anyone who uh, has no idea about this stuff it's it's all nonsensical (laughs) but Trust me, the uh, the competitiveness never ends in this in this industry. So, you do have uh, tiers of banks. So you have the the bold bracket banks, which would be your Goldman Sachs and and your Morgan Stanley. And then you have tier two banks, which would be more regional, something like HSBC or Credit Suisse, perhaps. Um, and then you'll have random banks no one's ever heard of, uh, as well as what they call elite boutiques, uh, which is an obnoxious way of saying someone who only focuses on buying and selling companies and performs no other function and doesn't have a balance sheet. Balance sheets can be important because if your bank has a balance sheet, you can typically do financing, which is a way to win also the advisory part of a deal. This is for some reason seen as less prestigious than if you just win the advisory part of a deal Uh, and the fees obviously are correspondent to advisory much higher. There's fewer resources, which is a, a nice way of saying slaves, <laughs> young uh, professionals being paid probably uh, $25 an hour to work on these deals. So if you, you have a smaller team working on a large deal, you can see how the economics of paying investment bank $10 million cascades down uh, mostly into the partner's big mouths and not very much into the analyst's tiny little bellies. Uh, from that, we can construct this hopefully picture or like you can have a figment of this in your mind where you understand that there is a large amount of money flowing through this advisory pipeline for relationship purposes. So I would pay an investment bank a percentage of a deal fee. So if the transaction, which is what they call it when you buy and sell a company is $200 million and I take 1%, then I'm taking effectively $2 million. And of that, I split it up in my team in terms of bonuses and salaries, and potentially I could be taking home as fund the lead banker, uh, something like $800,000 from one deal. Uh, and then if you do multiple deals over a year, you can see how you kill what you eat, it means if you're a successful investment banker, you could make multiple millions of dollars. And that's how we get this uh, Hollywood, uh, in, you might call it a display or, or, or caricature of what a banker is. And Gordon Gecko here was actually an investor. I think he was a uh, hostile uh, hedge fund guy. So he would take companies which are on the markets. Um, he would do a hostile takeovers. Um, so he's he's more of a, a different type of finance financier, but I've included him anyway, just because of the portrayal. And then once I said, Patrick Bateman is, is more classically a relationship banker for corporate finance clients and typically advising on M&A transactions. Uh, if you want to be an investment banker, it is actually rather simple in terms of 
Uh, the formula for it is, is not very difficult. You go and take an SAT, and if you've got a galaxy brain and you can score a perfect one, then you can get into Wharton, which is a University of Pennsylvania business school uh, where you study economics uh, and then you grind uh, away for four years doing that to get a BA in economics, at which point you apply for large investment banking roles as an analyst if you've not already got a summer internship as a spindly little uh, weak 21 year old who doesn't know anything uh, and you come back at 23 or so and become an investment banking analyst which is the lowest rung on the ladder of investment banking this is particularly attractive to people uh, because of the what they call exit opportunities so most people do not go in to be a career investment banker this is because the hours are atrocious you find yourself uh, questioning basically your life choices after not very long in the job, maybe three months to six months. And therefore you have to have a goal to see some light at the end of this tunnel of despair. Uh, in that we, we like to uh, imagine that there's something even better at the end, um, which is more money, even if it's the same amount of hours or there's more status and more prestige. Uh, and so we call that buy side. So this is when you want to go and work for a private equity company or a hedge fund where you can make multiple millions of dollars by the time you're 32, uh, which we will leave for another day. But the investment banker uh, in his uh, Tyro uh, opinion is saying, okay, well now I'm here, what do I have to do? to be successful uh, and that is work hard basically that's it you are a lamb to the slaughter so all you're expected to do is just take um well somewhat initiative but mostly just uh, orders uh, this is very much a foot soldier in the in the the finance army whereby you will get given tasks and you're expected to complete them and you say okay so why does an investment banker then work 100 hours a week 110 hours a week um because you may get 100 tasks <laughs> from five different bosses and they're all expected to be done by three nights hence uh, and you'll not be allowed to necessarily go home and sleep or wash or eat or exercise or see your loved ones or do anything other than plugging in numbers into a P&L. We have an example here of what a P&L is, a profit and loss statement. There are three financial statements, balance sheets, cash flows, and a P&L. We don't care about the other two so much. Where by we are trying to make a company very attractive by showing how much cash it makes uh you would think cash flow is important and i would agree but i find them boring so i don't want to show you that and i'll find a PL here which is much more exciting to look at how much revenue you can generate as a company minus your costs blah 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 how much money did you make that year the more money you make the more attractive you are because of something called a lbo now an lbo which is a leverage buyout is a function of the 80s whereby there were large Companies who realized you could more or less buy a functional company that may not be that exciting and either asset strip it, which is to sell it for parts and then thereby take home more equity than was uh, initially put into the company and, and make a return that way. Or you could leverage it, which is to say you put debt upon it. And when you put debt on a company, you're functionally paying less of your own money for the same company, you use that company's cash flow to pay down that debt. And thereby when you sell after a period, usually five to seven years, you've made X more amount money. And if the company also grows, you're compounding that return. And typically in the market, there's a IRR, which is an internal rate of return expectation, but you could say more or less, you want to three X your money. So if I put in one of my dollars, then I want three of those dollars back after five years uh, and the profits will be split if it's a PE firm uh, amongst the LPs and the GPs. But in general, this is why buying companies has become such a feeding frenzy and a shark tank because once the methodology was in, you know, basically engineered to say there's a really effective way to buy pretty standard companies but make multiple millions on them without having to grow them that much it became such a influential idea and there was a lot of uh, junk bond salesmen who made a lot of money out of the debt part of this. But there's also just a lot of advisors who made a lot of money in a very active M&A market. Uh, and that's because every time there's a transaction, you might take a percentage. And if you buy it, help someone buy a company, then potentially you also help them sell it five years later. Uh, and you can obviously see how this relationship can continue to roll amongst um, a fairly small investor market. So relationship management is a massive part of investment banking, even though an investment banking analyst is 
probably the most autistic person you'll ever meet and you can question if they have <laughs> social skills at all. Uh, you'll find most of those do not last and that the mo more successful are the either more psychopathic ones who can pretend to be empathetic or the genuinely uh, nice to be around people who will be willing to die for their clients. So these are the type of two bankers you'll see are career bankers. Uh, and that's, that's generally how uh, most of this high level finance functions. If you are interested in, in being that type of person or you already are that type of person, you're interested in getting rewarded for it, then investment banking can be very attractive. You can also work in selling specifically debt or equity. So an equity banker would probably work mostly with IPOs. An IPO is an initial public offering. It's when you have a private company and you want to take it public. So you want to list it on the stock market. You would invest in an investment banker to help you do that. Uh, and they do things like book running, but they also allow you to do a road show where you show off your company to all these large institutional investors to say, yes, you should underwrite us for 5%. If it's um, any large, say pension fund would be interested, anything from Vanguard uh, downwards, but also any other family offices and things like this. And so yeah, IPOs are just another function of financing. Uh, it's equity financing as opposed to debt financing. You can have uh, investment bankers who specialize in debt as well, where by you list bonds on the market, or you can obviously still have leverage bankers which are more interested in normal bank or commercial banks uh, lending money for transactions. So both of these are still very lucrative, uh, slightly less front office, you might say. And so there's this whole appeal to investment banking where the more front office you are, the uh, more prestigious you are. And so the, the better the bank, the more front office and this is maybe more recent, but the more appealing your industry or sector coverage is. So as you can imagine, there's this triangulation of prestige here, whereby you say, if I'm in technology, then I'm cooler than the guy who's doing uh, industrial pig farms or uh, agriculture, something like that uh, is, is one other layer of, of uh nonsensical prestige discussion in this in this industry. But in general, uh, that's the way they start to um, define the categories of types of bankers is what function you perform and what sectors you cover in terms of um, providing client services and then also how senior you are determines your role. So if you're an associate, then you'll be managing an analyst. Then if you're a vice president, then you're managing an associate and an analyst. And as you can imagine, it goes logically higher and higher and the money goes higher and higher and the hours actually don't lessen too much. So you're working probably 100 hour weeks until you're in your 40s, uh, divorced with three homes, one in uh, the Hamptons and one in New York. Um, but in any case, you'll you'll find that um, there's a strong correlation to uh, more or less this idea that finance is the epicenter of commercial and um, oper well, industrial productivity. So uh, New York finds itself as the heart of the economy. It, London finds itself as the heart of the economy. And this relates directly to finance. And in finance, you have the opinion that investment bankers are one arm of this uh, productivity scale. So there's also a lot of public discourse around banker bonuses and this um, the, the threat of having these men helping the more dastardly and unethical people of the world make money whilst my poor plumber friend is unemployed and or uh, living hand to mouth or making ends meet, things like that. So this is why they get that reputation. But when you meet bankers, you obviously find that most of them are either insufferable or miserable because the nice ones uh, typically don't enjoy working 100 hour weeks and the ones who do enjoy 100 hour weeks are not necessarily people you want to be around. So there, there is a, a lot of humanity uh, that disappears from this industry, uh, particularly the higher you go, which is not to say everyone is, is awful, but uh, there's probably a stronger concentration of awful people in the industry and awful not in terms of evil, just in terms of obnoxious and insufferable. So uh, and that's kind of what you're getting yourself into if you want to be an investment banker. It's nice if people tell you these things before you have to experience them because Eyes wide open is a much better strategy to approach a career versus uh, naivete and, and that sort of stuff is fairly common amongst young, as I said, greenhorn youth who think, okay, big money, let me make half a million dollars by the time I'm 26. And that is 
definitely a lot of money and it is possible to be an investment banker earning that much money at 26. The issue comes that nothing in this in this world is free. There is no free lunch and that's it, to pay the cost to be the boss means you will be sacrificing quite a lot of your own maybe integrity, but also uh, mental well-being and health and all these other correlating factors. So to that, uh, the direct role functions uh, in each level is basically a task doer of the person above you, uh, which is to say if you're an analyst and even associate, you'll be working on a financial model for a lot of the time. And when not doing that, you'll be making an investor presentation or pitch deck, a CIM, things like this, investment memorandum, where you'll be putting together the basics of why do you want to buy this company? And you can be strategic around this. And good junior bankers are much smarter about thinking holistically on a transaction than a maybe more myopic junior banker who is probably more concerned with how do I get this balance sheet to balance or making sure these numbers look right or that I've made sure that I'm not getting yelled at tomorrow by just implementing comments in a deck. Uh, and here is what separates the wheat from the chaff is to say that good bankers tend towards not wanting to be bankers and the bad bankers not knowing what else to do tend to be lifers. So you have this misbalance in talent and that's why in the industry you have a large chasm between what you might call the talented buy side and the less talented sell side uh, and that those who are seen as being less high performers tend to have to remain bankers. This is not necessarily true. This is just the perception in the market. Uh, and it's not even necessarily correlated with money. There are probably many senior bankers who earn um, multiples of the less successful buy side. But uh, in general, if you, if you think of service industries that the person who's giving the orders tends to be more desirous in, in, in terms of a, a role or a, or a job because you want to be bossing others around, then bankers are at the whim and fancy of almost every client that they serve. So they'll always say yes and push very slightly back on, on multiple things, which ends up being a lot of requests by clients for things that maybe are nugatory and worthless. And the analyst and associates cop most of that in terms of actual work, having to implement and re-implement comments, uh, both on the model, the financials, but also the pitch deck. And so in general, you find that the work becomes fairly monotonous and low skill ceiling, uh, which is why, once again, the buy side is slightly more attractive to people in finance because you have a skill set which is very transferable, but also allows for a role which is much more stimulating mentally. Uh, so I would recommend if you're very good with people and don't mind the monotony to remain a banker because you can be a very successful banker and probably earn multitudes more money than you would in other financial roles. But once again, we're talking a very uh, specific type of person here. And so you have to understand your own personality, your own ocean score, your own IQ, your skill set, what drives you. Um, if it is status and prestige, then maybe something else should have been the calling that you chose versus if money is the knee plus ultra uh, that you aspire to, it's, it's the apogee of your life is to be a big swinging dick then this is the career for you uh, and you need to just suck it up until you're 35 and potentially have made a uh, junior director or, or if you're really, really good managing director. Um, what defines good basically is fees. If you can generate fees for the bank, you're determined to be good no matter how you do it, scrupulous or unscrupulous, uh, which is the best indicator of performance is your bonus. So it's, it's quite a good industry if you're slightly, um, I would say autistic, but uh, you prefer a mechanism which is a direct reflection of your performance. It's a little bit like sport, and that's probably why a lot of uh, washed out athletes tend towards finances because it's a very measurable and um, simple in, in that sense career path. Uh, the last few points I will say is that the Hollywood portrayal of anything related to investment banking is always way more glamorous than the reality of stinking, sweating, crusted over eyelids at 3 a.m. with the tepid breath of a Chinese uh, barely warmed dinner that cost the bank $22, which you had to bill through a an app, an in-house expensing app. 
uh, which is to say that there's very little glory involved in this industry. It really is about pursuing something you think you'll be good at because in general, you're rewarded psychologically from performing tasks which you perform well and being better than other people and understanding and implementing those skills that you do have. This is how, as humans, we, we function. And so if you want to earn a lot of money, this is definitely one of those careers that will do it. If you are more concerned with a balanced way to earn lots of money than tech, so being a software engineer or some something involved with tech is probably a better way to go. I think in general, there's a large emphasis on telling smart young professionals to be lawyers corporate lawyers, uh, consultants for someone like McKinsey or an investment banker. But in general, I feel like it's probably quite a bad waste of talent, at least from a intellectual standpoint. Uh, and now most people will obviously aspire to money. But I think in general, once you have some money, you realize that potentially your, your, your life should be valued or you should reflect holistically on your life from a more philosophical standpoint where Money is just one reflection of how you've gone about obtaining what it is that drives you from a, we could say psychosomatic, but a, a psychic standpoint of, of um, you could say goal attainment and, and, and uh, self-esteem, how it's related to, to your existence. So I would caution you to only pursue investment banking if you do feel like it would be good for you and it won't be something that drives you to an extreme scenario whereby you're quitting the corporate race totally and going to hide out in Alaska in a pig farm, or you're jumping off a 57 story building, or you're having a heart attack at your desk. These are three more common than you think uh, outcomes from people who do pursue high finance, uh, and particularly corporate finance and particularly investment banking at large institutions. It is churn and burn, so there's no sympathy given for, for those people. And if you're expecting there to be a touch of humanity in your bosses, you're unfortunately mistaken. Uh, so eyes wide open, yeah? That's that's the kind of, should be the mantra that you go into with this thing. Um, and, and it is to say, I'm happy to expound more on this topic. I think it's just one of those things where it was missing in the body of work of if I wanted to get into a specific career that I've heard so much about, negative and positive from different outlets, what is the harsh reality of it? And and here's the, the summation, which is basically, you will earn lots of money, but it may cost you everything. <laughs>